Hello everyone. It's great to be back at Visionis Sonoris for 2021 and to be part of the MTI at De Montfort University team presentations for this festival. I hope you enjoy what I have to say. It's a great pity I can't hear your questions immediately afterwards, but anyway, I look forward to any and all exchanges with my wonderful Mexican friends. I've been listening to electronically produced sound and music for over 50 years. And I remember some of the earliest concerts I went to had a profound effect on me. What do I mean by that? I want to talk about what it made me feel. And I think that's very important because what we feel, what we think about, how it actually affects us, is a direct contribution to what the music means. And that's been a very slippery, very difficult subject over the years. Nobody can really agree, and nor should they agree. These things are often very personal. That's why I want us to begin to talk about them a bit more. My aim is not to define a vocabulary, but my aim is to encourage us to share our feelings about the music, what it does to us, what it does for us. I assembled some of these thoughts in a book chapter I published in uh, 2018 called Feeling Sound, and I realised I'd never actually given this chapter in a talk form. If you want more detail, I do refer you to this chapter. So I'm going to look at some early memories I have of listening to this kind of music. I'm going to choose works by Roger Smalley, Karl-Heinz Stockhausen, John Cage, Dennis Smalley and Philip Glass. Roger Smalley, by the way, my teacher at Cambridge, is not related to Dennis Smalley. Uh, Roger uh, was a brilliant composer and pianist and established the group Intermodulation with his uh, friend Tim Suster. Roger and Tim were both residents at King's College in Cambridge while I was there in the late 60s, very early 70s, and I studied with them both. So let's start. What I hear resembles nothing I've ever heard before. Sounds that come to me in clouds, veils, walls, waves of sound in seamless succession. They may be described as glutinous, dense, noisy and brash, but not for me ugly. There's an intensity to a brooding atmosphere that is almost physical. There are complex walls and webs of sound, from the low bass to the high treble. There are complex polyrhythmic textures producing an ebb and flow of tension. Then I shall never forget comes a breakout of great energy, a tutti moment all the brass players are playing together. Sometimes they alternate in antiphonal groups, but here they all sound at once, quite synchronised. Sound seems to be literally higher than the instruments. I'm not immersed, but a wave is coming towards me without ever actually arriving. My imagination moves me forward towards the music, this is encouraged by the layout of the stage in the arc. Ring modulation deals with frequency rather than pitch transposition, so harmonic sounds tend to be transformed into inharmonic ones. Of course, it was also popular through the TV series Doctor Who, the science fiction series which uh, many of you will know about. Six months is a long time. I've been studying with Roger and got to know a lot of music in the time, especially that of Karl Heinz Stockhausen. His group is performing in London. The piece I choose to remember for this discussion is a tape work of his, Telemusique.
sound is extraordinary from that first impact. Bright, dazzling, if not blinding. You can look away from a bright light, I hope, but that's more difficult with your ears. It's there all the time. But it's incredibly intense and very interesting. It's not static. It seems bizarrely to combine a kind of insect-like activity integrated with an almost overpowering electronic fizz of some kind. Do I really perceive the world musics that the composer talked about in his pre-concert talks? I glimpse them, strangely distorted, never clear, always veiled. The space of the piece is quite special. Five discrete channels presented across the stereo image. There's no dynamic panning in the piece. The channels stay fixed. This gives us a kind of window onto the world. Windows, a kind of panopticon. But the window metaphor's not quite right. The tele of the title makes this more of a lens, a strangely distorting one at that. There is movement. We come closer and move further away from the sounds. It's a near-far movement rather than a left-right movement. Magnification does not change the real position of what we observe, but does change our relationship to it and the detail we perceive. Listening to this work in 1970 is, of course, the height of the Cold War. Radio was a frontline weapon in the Cold War. And my hearing of this music is as if I'm tuning a radio. And, of course, Stockhausen used the radio metaphor in many, many of his pieces and in that time. And it was then that I went to York to look at their studio, to meet Richard Orton, who introduced me to Dennis Smalley. He said very briefly to Dennis, play me your new piece, Dennis, in the studio. And Dennis played me Pond Slopes, which he had completed three months or so before. I thought it was the most extraordinary sound, the most incredible piece that I'd yet heard of studio music. There's something essentially real, yet not quite recognisable, about the sound world. And I remember thinking that to describe the sounds demands a vocabulary of substances, qualities, behaviours. I remember, too, thinking that the sound was almost touchable. It's clearly out there in front of me. I feel I could reach out, but maybe that might be a little bit dangerous, as some of the sounds seem very hot and others razor sharp. And some sounds appear to be in front of the loudspeakers, taking me completely by surprise. But this agency is what really came across in the, in the music. This ability to see substances right there in front of you. I've always had a slightly synesthetic view of electronic music. I'm not truly synesthetic, but I tend to see things happening when I listen to pieces such as this one. I've always been interested in psychoacoustics, how sound behaves at the micro level. In 1975, I went to the Roundhouse in London for one of the very earliest concerts in the UK by the Philip Glass Ensemble. Music in 12 parts. My initial response is to be surprised by the lack of directional space. I can see the performers on stage, yet the sound seems to be immediately around me. I can see clearly the four channel surround sound system, but though rationally the source of what I hear, no sound is in the loudspeaker, or even apparently near it. 
This is almost as if the spectral play of the sound is physical, maybe touchable, immediately in front of me. It seems to have a real physical presence, and I have, once again, a near synesthetic experience of it. I know through visual information there is a soprano saxophone. The blend is near perfect. It's made noticeable only on entry or exit. If a player starts or stops, you can tell by difference that this is the case, but you wouldn't hear in the run or flow of the piece what exactly was being produced by what. The voice is exactly the same. And a more interesting case, because we recognise a vocal component within the line, and humans are built with this ability to an extreme degree. The continuing shift of pattern generates artefacts, some and different tones, warping spectra and the like, the psychoacoustic effects I referred to. What is out there and what's within the ear is a delightful game that I play during the performance. I'm not quite sure where these things are happening. I marvel at the synchronization of the performers. It's an incredible ability to stay exactly on the pulse in exactly the right way. But wait, it is because they are humans and they are not computers that we get the very tiny differences which cause the effects which I admire so much in the music. I first heard John Cage at a concert for his 60th birthday in 1972 in London in the Albert Hall. I've not been able to find a recording of this. I'm going to recall a concert for his 70th birthday, 10 years later in 1982, when he did an arrangement of Roratorio, an Irish circus on Finnegan's Wake, for live performers. It was originally a Hirschbier, commissioned by the Westdeutsche Rundfunk in Cologne, who made it in their studios in 1979. In the gallery around us, it was a converted church, were Irish folk musicians. Above us are a group of, I think it was 16 loudspeakers. This projected down on the audience a vast mix of the sounds of contemporary Ireland in which Cage had gone through Finnegan's Wake and he'd then gone to Ireland to the exact places mentioned in the wake and made recordings at those places and then gone back to the studio and created a mix of these. This was a fantastic example of what I have called frame transformation. Cage projected spaces from outside into our midst, and also he was performing the work inlets for highly amplified conch shells, beautiful, vast shells, partly full of water, which he would rotate and highly amplified, and they were most extraordinary projection of something tiny and small into something large, while the sounds of contemporary Ireland, contemporary Dublin, were something potentially very large projected down into the space we were in. These transformations were profoundly effective and had a great effect on how I conceive of space and the space of performances and the spaces of sounds. So let's share what we've heard, what we feel, what we think, what we mean by the music we do. I think it's important that composers, performers, listeners, anyone interested in these musics can discuss what is going on when we actually listen to them. How do we feel what we do? Good observers will notice I'm wearing my Mexican shirt, which I got at Merida Airport on my way to Morelia in 2018 for Visiones Sonoras that year. I shall wear it again when I see you, which I hope will be very soon. Thank you very much.